down there. I never think about it. But anyway, I've made two thresholds for my son. One of them to go from his new addition into his old house. And the new addition, the floor is level and the old house it's not. So I had to make a threshold, the underside of which was tapered to fit an uneven floor and the other side to make a, to make a level floor. That was a pretty good challenge. And then the other one I made was for his, he re, re, made their bathroom and I made one for in there. So, but a threshold, well, let me read this from Mark chapter 10, verse 24 to 27. The disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said with man, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Amen. Would you bow your heads with me? Dear Lord, we thank you for the Awesome God that does the impossible, for nothing is impossible with you, Lord. We all are sinners that are saved only because of the grace of God, only because you have done the impossible in our lives, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, for that. And as we feast on your word this morning, we pray that you'll guide it into our hearts and that you'll cause it to have the effect that you want it to have. In Jesus' name, amen. When you enter, you cross a threshold. Whether it's actually a physical threshold that somebody made or not, it's crossing a threshold. A threshold is the bottom part of a doorway. Maybe it could be the foundation of a doorway. But in order to go through a doorway, you must go over the threshold. It can be a room to room threshold. To cross a threshold, you have to emerge from one environment or surrounding into another. You might be going from outside to inside. You might be going from inside to outside. There's usually a reason to cross the, to cross the threshold. Maybe it's cold outside and warm inside. Cross the threshold, get warmed up. Maybe it's hot outside and you have air conditioning inside. Cross the threshold, get cooled off. Maybe you're running away from something. I ran away from a nest of bald-faced hornets. I had to cross the threshold and slam that screen door behind me. They didn't get me. They came close. I was running. I couldn't run now. I, I'll just leave those hornets alone now, but I didn't know they were there. I found out real fast, started running. They give chase. They come after you. So I crossed a threshold. Crossing a threshold is a change. Crossing a threshold is also going through a doorway. There's no threshold there if there isn't a doorway. It wouldn't make any sense to put a threshold and not have a doorway. It's entering somewhere or something. Life is a series of thresholds or doorways. Birth, the first threshold one crosses is an involuntary one. Birth is an emerging. The baby emerges into life outside the mom. That baby is crossing a threshold. School. I remember first grade. I had been in kindergarten for two weeks. They thought I was bored. Actually, I was antisocial. So they flunked me up into first grade. Did you ever hear of such a thing? Because I went into kindergarten and I stood by the door like this until it was time to go home. Those other kids were running around playing like a bunch of little kids which is what they were. I didn't want to do that. My plan was climbing trees and chasing butterflies and 
I didn't want to do that. So I stood by the door until it was time to go home. They thought, they thought something wrong with me. And it was. I was antisocial. They didn't know that. They didn't ask me. They gave me some kind of aptitude test. I can remember that. And they said, yeah, you put them in first grade after two weeks. And when I went into first grade, there were three or four girls that were crying at the door when their mother brought them to first grade. I didn't know why they were crying. This was two weeks after school started. They were still crying at the door. She was there. We met in the first grade. She wasn't crying. But there were, I don't even know who that was. It was. Did you remember any girls crying? You don't remember that? You remember that they were crying, though. And this was two weeks after school started. And they didn't want to go in there. Maybe they were afraid of the penguin. <laughs> the nun that was teaching us. I don't know, but... They had to go across the threshold of being okay with school. <laughs> Emerging from school. So we did our best to learn. After they stuffed us with as much knowledge as possible, they turned us loose on the world and you cross another threshold at that point and then some go into advanced education or technical training of some kind some went to college some went to trade school some went to work and learned a skill on the job i have probably photographed i try to figure in my 45 years i probably photographed close to 50,000 seniors and high school seniors and I always had conversations with them and I usually inquired what kind of career choices uh, they were considering and most of them didn't know some of them knew some of them were choosing strange things uh, but most of them didn't know I don't know I'm gonna take a year off and try to figure it out I'm gonna go to college what are you gonna study I don't know I'm going to go to college with an undeclared major and maybe then I'll figure it out. You know, I wish someone would tell them that they have to learn a marketable skill. Something that you can make a living at and get a paycheck with. But some kids go through school and do not ever learn a marketable skill. It's strange. But even Paul had a marketable skill. He was a tent maker. Did you know that? He had, a, he, had a, he had a trade. And he was able to partner with Aquila and Priscilla. They were tent makers. So he had a skill besides being able to preach the word and, and do ministry. So then you cross another threshold, you go to work. And that's a major threshold, a major one. You have to learn to satisfy a boss. And sometimes that's not easy. Sometimes it is. But you have to continue learning and developing your skills. Even if you went to college, and you might come out of college thinking that you're really brilliant. <laughs> oh, I went to college. I'm a brilliant person. <laughs> and then you go to work and you realize how much you don't know. So you have to continue learning and developing your skills 2 Thessalonians 3.10 For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. The one who is unwill unwilling to work shall not eat. So, today there are uh, college graduates that are living in their parents' basement. They're not going to work. Most of them are going to work, but that's what, that's what, that's what it says. Proverbs 12.11 Those who work their land will have abundant food, but those who chase fantasies have no sense. And there's another threshold. Marriage. <laughs> Joining with someone of the opposite sex for life till death do us part. Everyone should mean those words, till death do us part. In marriage, you have to be sensitive and considerate. I don't know how a marriage can survive unless God is at the center of it. 
and probably more than half of them don't survive. There used to be a statistic, I don't know what it is now, of how many marriages fail and how many people are just, don't bother with marriage, they just move in. That's not what God wants us to do. Genesis 2.24, that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. And Hebrews 13, for marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure for God will judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral. <clears throat> so that's the threshold of marriage. Life is full of thresholds. The next one is raising children. Proverbs 22, 6, start children off on the way they should go and when they're old, they will not turn from it. And Psalm 127, Three to five children are a heritage from the Lord, offspring a reward from him, like arrows in the hands of a warrior, are children born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they contend with their opponents in court. We love our kids. We protect them. We nurture them. We're proud of their accomplishments. Everything seems to be going well until they turn 14. <laughs> but we survive. We survive that. It, you know, it, it, you get through it. <laughs> you have a few battle scars, but you get through it. Salvation is the biggest, most important th threshold in life Amen. the good news the gospel that Jesus died to pay the penalty for our sins is the most life changing news that anyone can encounter and I use the word encounter because some get saved after reading the, after reading the gospel in the Bible most however hear the good news they hear it from someone they hear it from a preacher or a teacher or a parent or somebody that has a burden from the lost, a next door neighbor, somebody at work. But some do get it, like, like, the, like the Gideons will tell you about people who were in a motel room and were gonna do suicide and there's a Bible in there and they read the Bible and they got saved. That happens just by reading the word, but mostly it's by someone sharing the gospel. The soul winner, the gospel carrier, partners with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is always there to help. God doesn't force anyone. We wonder why everyone isn't like us, happy and content and on the way to heaven. We wonder why. Matthew seven thirteen to 14, enter through the narrow gate for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Only a few. Some refuse to believe. Some won't cross the salvation threshold. They're on that wide path, that wide road, and at the intersection where that little road turns off, that's where the cross is. That's where the good news is. That's where the gospel is. That's where they hear it. And some say, I don't want to hear that. I'm going to go my own way. They stay on the broad, on the broad road that so leads to destruction. We know what that narrow road is. We all know what it is. And we, most of us have been on the broad road. Thank you, Jesus, that we turned off at the cross and got on the narrow road. Hearing from God is another threshold. God speaks to us through the impressions of the Holy Spirit. 1 Kings 19, 12 to 13, after the earthquake came a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. And the King James is still small voice when Elijah heard it 
He pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He was running away from, uh, what was her name? Jezebel? Jezebel. Yeah, he was, that was what he was doing. He had defeated the 400 prophets of Baal, and then she had murderous threats against him, and he ran away. The gentle whisper, the still, small voice. Whatever you hear has to be in alignment with God's word because there are other spirits that speak. And if it speaks something that's not in God's word, the spirit always goes the way of the word. So if it's not, if it's not Bible, then that is not God's voice. But a good example of learning to hear from God and listening to the Holy Spirit is Samuel. In 1 Samuel chapter 3, the boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. He was a little boy at this point. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, that was the priest on duty at Shiloh at the time, whose eyes were becoming so weak he could, he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. But Eli said, I did not call, go back and lie down. So he went back and lie down. Again the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, I, Here I am, you called me. My son, Eli, said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not been revealed to him. A third time the Lord called, Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, Go and lie down, and if he calls you, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went in and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there calling, as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Learning to hear from God is a wonderful part of the believer's life. We need to say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. We need to say that. We need to invite God's word, his still small voice to come in to our spirits. When we pray, we give God a list of things that we want him to do for us. Then we close off the communication and say, well, Lord, I'll see you again in a few hours or tomorrow or whatever. And we're not listening. He's listening to us, but we're not listening to him. If you did that to a person, you would be rude. But we do it to God. Amen. We do that to God. We give him a list of stuff, and then we cut off the communication. We need to give God time in the conversation to speak of the still, small voice, to just impre an impression. People say, well, God told me, and there is an audible voice, but, but people think you're hearing things, and you're hearing things with your spirit. Usually, that's how it is. So moving into God's will is another threshold, Romans 12, 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Sometimes God's will isn't the same as ours. With me, it's been a lot of times. <laughs> I try to convince the Lord 
to do a certain thing the way I think he should do it. But he calls us sometimes to do something that we're uncomfortable with. I call it comfort zonitis. Moses didn't go back. He didn't want to go back to Egypt. He didn't want to do that. He made excuses. Moses had to cross a threshold. He didn't think that he was able. That was a threshold he had to get over. At this point, he was a shepherd for 40 years. He could lead sheep. He had never led people before. Now he's being called to lead a whole nation out of another nation. And he didn't think he could do that. He made excuses. But what God calls you to do, God will enable you to do. He will prepare you to do. And you only have to cross the threshold of being willing to do his will. The threshold of faith, Hebrews 11. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. So that what is seen was not made out of what is visible. By faith Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith Abel still speaks even though he is dead. By faith Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists, and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Faith is a requirement. It's not optional for us to believe. Those who refuse to believe are lost. They are lost. We were all lost before we came to the Lord in faith. We have hope that many will come to faith. We pray for our loved ones who don't believe that they will come to the threshold of faith and cross into it into the life of knowing the Lord. Jesus crossed a threshold of love when he agreed to go to the cross. He didn't have to do that. His father crossed a threshold. He didn't have to see his only begotten son suffer and die on the cross. It was the only way for us to be saved. But they could have terminated the experiment Matthew 26, 53 and 54. Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? How then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? One angel would have been enough. <laughs> but he could have had 12 legions. I guess that's probably 12,000. There's a song he could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free but he died alone during that song my wife gave her heart to the Lord during that song she came into the church not knowing why she was in there and during that song she gave her heart to the Lord in 1900 Palm Sunday 1973 God could have terminated the whole race he could have ended it but he put his love on display when he gave his only begotten son to be the only sacrifice that could satisfy, that could ever pay the penalty for all the sins of all mankind. Jesus was appointed from the very beginning to do that. He didn't have to go through with it. He didn't have to, to suffer the agony of rejection. He didn't have to suffer suffer the agony of, of scourging, didn't have to suffer the agony of the crown of thorns. He didn't have to suffer the agony of being nailed to the cross. 
didn't have to suffer the agony of taking all the sins of all mankind unto himself. 2 Corinthians 5.21 God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And at that moment, his father turned away from him. The worst agony of all. His father was still there, but his impression was that God had turned from him at that moment. Matthew 27, 45, 46, from noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried in a, out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In his perception, the father had left him. God was still there. He's always there. But Jesus became sin, all the sin. And, he, and God's presence was no longer felt. He felt abandoned. Why have you forsaken me? And that's why he cried out as he did. It took all that to secure a place in heaven for the believers, for those who accept him as Lord and Savior. Should we show the Lord how much we love and appreciate him? I was watching some videos of soldiers that are coming back home and surprising their families, you know, like like uh, one of them went into a gymnasium and uh, the girl was more, probably a cheerleader and she runs over there and jumps on him and different different scenarios. I watched a bunch of them. Showing how love, love and appreciate their fathers. But we do anything to show God how we appreciate our salvation. First Timothy 2 8, therefore I want the men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. Lifting up holy hands is one of the ways that we demonstrate our love for him, and it's his will. From the time of Moses to the early church, it was common to lift up your hands in prayer to God. When King Solomon prayed at the temple, we read how he also spread out his hands toward heaven. No doubt he often watched his father David do the same. We read again and again how the psalmist David would come to the Lord. Hear my cry for mercy as I call to you for help, as I lift my hands. And he encouraged others to do the same. The prophets Came, be came before the Lord in similar ways in an act of humility. Ezra tells us, I fell on my knees with my hands spread out to the Lord. And during worship, he stood and praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen. Whether it's lifting our hands or kneeling or bowing our heads or closing our eyes, the most important posture is our heart posture am I surrendered to God have I received fresh forgiveness and and determined out of love for him to turn away from sin am I taken by his greatness his beauty his majestic power Demonst demonstrative worship is an act of surrender I surrender to your will of God the threshold, we're talking about thresholds today. The threshold of surrender. Psalm 68, 3 and 4. But may the righteous be glad and rejoice before our God. May they be happy and joyful. Sing to God. Sing in praise of his name. Extol him who rides on the clouds. Rejoice before him. His name is the Lord. That's our God. We need to cross thresholds. Threshold of worship, threshold of faith, threshold of hearing from God, threshold of carrying the gospel. We need to do all those things, thresholds. Crossing over from one state of mind, 
one state of heart, one state of emotion to another. Getting closer and closer to God. Isn't that what we want to do? Get closer to God. Closer to God. Be more yielded, more supple, more willing to listen, to hear, and to do His will, to do what He wants us to do. Amen? Would you stand? I'm going to turn you loose. I'm going to turn you loose into the world. Go and do some damage to the devil's strongholds. Go and tear some of those down and do some damage to the evil one. Amen? Father God, I thank you so much for this church, Lord. And I would ask that you expand this church, Lord, because I know there are people who want a place to worship, Lord, and this is it. Want a place to grow in you, this is it. Want a place where they can have fellowship with believers, this is it. Have a place where they'll be loved, this is it. Bring them here, Lord. We will love them. We will. So, Lord, as we go our own ways, we pray that this word will stay with us and that we'll be doers of it. In Jesus' name, amen.